Meruchim and Ba'im, ladies, we are studying today Rashat Re'eh. Our Perasha always will fall out the Shabbat before we announce Rosh Chodesh Elul. This week on Wednesday we have Rosh Chodesh which represents the last month of the year before Rosh Hashanah which is the most significant month because all the preparation for the high holidays begins in the month of Elul and as I've always explained to you the Shabbat before has all the powers of the upcoming week so all the strength of the Chodesh Elul is already in the Shabbat. And as I said, we always read Parashat Re'eh. It's as if the Torah is telling us, Re'eh, look, Re'eh is Rashi Tevot. There's three letters, Resh, Aleph, He. Re'eh, Elul, Higia. Go look, Elul is here. As if the Torah is waking us up. <clears throat> in order that we should begin our preparations. In Al Pirasha, it talks about many things, but one of the mitzvot is the inyan of the ma'asir. The Torah says, Asir ta'asir. It's called Tibu'at Zar'icha. <coughs> That you have to give a tithe. A tithe is a ma'asir. 10%. Today we don't have uh, fields, let's say, by, by us. So we give 10% of our money to the tzedakah. But in the olden days they had fields. So they were obligated to give from their wheat and their produce to give it to the Kohen or to the Levi. Aser ta Aser. On this mitzvah of Aser to Aser, the rabbis ask, why does it say it twice, Aser to Aser? It should say, ten ma'aser, give a tenth. Aser to Aser is double language. So the rabbis learn from here, that if a person wants, he's allowed to give up to 20%. A person that wants to give his money away, more than 20% he shouldn't. Because then already he's going to give too much away, then he's going to, he's going to need money himself. <clears throat> so the Torah says, Asir ta asir. You can give 10% twice. That's the cap, that's the, the maximum. But there's a deeper explanation to this Asir ta asir. But in order to understand it, we need to go back to a parasha in Bereshit. I told you many times our Torah is interconnected. A pasuk that you read in Parashat Re'eh needs to be understood <coughs> by going all the way back to something we read in the winter. That we can understand now what we're reading in the summer. The whole Torah is linked. That's why you have to have the whole book at all times. You can't just read this parasha in a... In a, in a vacuum, where you're just looking at it alone. Every pasuk of the Torah, when you read it, you have to look at it in the bigger, in the bigger picture. Which parasha are we going to go to? We're going to go to the parasha of Toledot. In that parasha, it's a big parasha, very important. That's when we had the birth of twins. Who was born? Yaakov and Esav. <coughs> and the Pasuk writes when they were born, Admoni. The first one came out, Admoni, he was red. He was all hairy. So they called him Esav. 
Vahanechen Yatsa Achiv, and then his brother came out. We know that's Yaakov. Viyado Ochezet Ba'akiv Aisav. When he came out, he was holding his brother's heel. Vayikra Shemo Yaakov. So because he was holding on to the heel, so they called him Yaakov. Yaakov comes from the word Akib. Now that she is bothered, his name should have been Akib. Since he was holding on to the Akib. Vayikra Shemo Yaakov. There's an extra youth in his name. Where did the extra youth come from? So that she's bothered by this. And she says, that what? Ah. So he says like this, that he went, Yaakov, and he took the letter Yud from Esav. Esav's name was supposed to be Asui. Ayin Sin Vav Yud. What does Asui mean? Asui means he's made. He's done. He's complete. Because he was born already fully mature. The guy's born with hair already. He needed a haircut the day he was born. So you see, he was Asui. He was fully developed. But for some reason, Yaakov took the Yud, the last Yud, from Esav, instead of Asui, he took the Yud, and he put it in his name. Now, this needs to be understood. That's why the Pasuk says, V'yado ochezet, his hand was holding Ba'akev Esav. Akev Esav means the heel of Esav, or it could mean the end of Esav. What's the last letter of Esav? The last letter was Yud, Asui. Viyado Ochezet, his hand was holding Ba'akev Esav with the last letter of Esav. He grabbed the, he grabbed the Yud. The Holy Books write, Viyado can also be read Viyudo, the Yud. Yudo, Viyado, Viyudo, he took the, he took the Yud. He took the Yud from Esav and he took it to his name. <coughs> this needs to be understood. Not only that, the rabbis tell us that Be'azat Hashem when Eliyahu and Navi comes, he's going to take another letter from Esav. He's going to take away the Vav. Because in the Tanakh, there's five times, it says Eliyahu and Navi's name, it says Eliyah. It's missing a Vav. It says Eliyah, it doesn't say Eliyahu. So the Gemara says, where's the Vav? He says, oh, don't worry. When Mashiach comes, he's going to grab the Vav from Esav's name. Poor guy, Yaakov took the Yud from him, and in the hour of Avi, he's going to take the Vav from him, <coughs> and then he's going to end up Ash. Ash is something that's moldy or deteriorating. So we're waiting for that. We're waiting for Kunoke Ash Yiblu, that he will deteriorate like Ash, like something that is all moldy and all uh, 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 deteriorating, as I said. So that's good news. That's why I'll tell you just something I'm thinking now that I saw in the Sefer. <clears throat> you remember when we studied Parashat Pinchas? In Parashat Pinchas, God tells Pinchas, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Lachen, hineni noten lo et shalom. I'm going to make you a covenant of peace. The Achamim say, what is this covenant that God made with Pinchas? Peace from the Satan. That the Satan will not be able to kill Pinehas. Pinehas eventually transformed into Eliyahu and Navi, and we know that Eliyahu and Navi lives forever. There's a peace treaty between Eliyahu and Navi and the Satan. The Satan comes to get him, and he has a peace treaty. Shalom, I have shalom. That's the peace treaty that God made. He lives forever. That's why sometimes Eliyahu and Navi comes down. The Tzadikim see Eliyahu and Navi. Sometimes he appears like a regular person and saves people's lives and talks to them and so on and so forth. If you look at the word Shalom, when God says, I'm going to give you the peace treaty, Biriti Shalom, the Vav of Shalom is cut. You don't have a word like this in the whole Torah. A Vav usually is a straight line down. This Vav is written halfway, then there's a little space, and then they finish it. There's a, a blank piece of space in between the Vav. Vav Kiti'ah. 
The vav is broken. And the rabbis explained because God was giving a signal to Eliyahu that your vav is going to be broken. You're only going to be Eliyah. The vav of yours is cut. When is it going to be fixed? When you come and usher in the Mashiach, you'll take the vav from Isav, and then we'll connect, uh, we'll connect it back together again. So, Be'azat Hashem, Esav, he started off in the womb, Asui. Before he got out, <laughs> Yaakov grabs the Yud. And now he's uh, Esav. And then in the other we'll take the vav from him, and finished. And then Esav will be destroyed by Azat Hashem and Rabbi Amin. Now, we need to explain, what does it mean he took the Yud? Uh, what does it mean? Why, well, he's not happy with the name Akev? He needs the extra Yud. So I want to say one interpretation that I saw brought down in Sfarim. It's big Hadush. We know that there's 12 months of the year. <coughs> I'm talking about the Hebrew calendar. Nisan, Iyas, Ivan, Tammuz, etc. It says in the books that Yaakov and Esav divided the months of the year. <coughs> Yaakov took six and Esav took six. That was the deal that they made. If it was up to Yaakov, he'd take all twelve. But he had no choice. Esav is his brother, the twins, they have to split everything equal, 50-50. So it says, Yaakov Abinu took the months, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan. Those are great months. Nisan is when we came out of Egypt. That's a lucky month. Iyar, is the month that we count Sfirat Omer. We prepare for the holiday of Shavuot. Yeah, it's a great month. And Sivan is the best month. That's the, that's the month that we receive the Torah. So those three months are under the domain of Yaakov. That's why every year, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, those are favorable months. But now, Esav says, you took three. So I have to take three. What's the next three months? Tammuz, Av, Elul. It's only fair. Now we know how bad the month of Tammuz is. That's where we have the beginning of the destruction of the temple. That's when uh, the Romans came and besieged the city. That's when the wall was breached. All the troubles begin in Tammuz. Not only that, but the month of Av is even worse. That's when the temples were actually destroyed. So just like Yaakov's months are good months, Esav's months, he puts his uh, poison in them. But Yaakov Abinu told uh, Esav, you can't have Elul. Elul's too important for us. You see, Esav wanted Elul because it's the month before the high holidays. If he could take that month into his domain, it'll cause the Jewish people to be uh, sleeping during the month. Meaning, they won't make the Shubah, they won't prepare... And if they don't prepare for the high holidays, the judgment will be bad against them. He knew what he was doing. By taking the month of Elul, he's trying to ruin the judgment of the Jewish people. Yaakov is impossible. I'll give you a different month. But Elul's coming, has to stay by me. And Baruch Hashem, don't ask me how, but Yaakov ended up with Elul. We're lucky. That's why we get excited when it comes to Elul. We go to Silihot every single morning. Ashkenazim, they go to Shofar after the Tefillah. There's many uh, 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 things that we do in order to prepare. That's only because Yaakov took the month back. Now, there's a book called Sefer Yitzirah. Sefer Yitzirah writes that every single month was created with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I cannot explain you why this month is connected to this letter and the other month is connected to another letter. I can only quote what he says. He writes, the month of Elul, that was created with the letter Yud. Oh, now we understand. When Yaakov Abinu was born, so his name was supposed to be Akiv because he was holding on to the heel. But he saw that Isab has the Yud in there. That means the Yud is the month of Elul. Esav's holding on to the month of Elul. Yaakov says, impossible. We cannot let him have the Yud which represents the month of Elul. So he, he grabbed it. V'yado ochezet. His hand was holding Ba'akev at the end of Esav. 
The end means the third month of Esav. The end. Because Yaakov got Nisan, Iyar, Sivan. And what did Esav get? Tammuz, Ab, Elul. Elul is the Akev. It's the end of Esav. The Yado, is the Akev, Esav. He took the third month of Esav, which is corresponding to the letter Yud, and he took it for himself. So that's very, very uh, significant for us. Very, very uh, beneficial that Baruch Hashem, we got this month back. But, Ba'azat Hashem, I'd like to explain this uh, on a deeper level. What does it mean Yaakov took the Yud? The Pasuk says, when God created Adam, Ve'yitzer Hashem Elohim et Adam, and God created the Adam, the man, the word Vayitzer is he created. If you look in the word Vayitzer, there's two Yuds. Vav, Yud, Yud, Sadi Resh, Vayitzer. The Gemara asks, what do these two Yuds represent? Ladies, every time you see the letter Yud, Yud is a very holy letter. Yud is the beginning of the name of God, Yud Ke So you have two Yuds next to each other in one word, Vayitzer. So the Gemara wants to know, what is these two Yuds? Manasseh says, Echad Yetzir Tov, Echad Yetzir Ra. The Yud stands for Yetzir, inclination. The good inclination and the evil inclination. So when God created man, He created two sections in His heart. On the right side you have the good conscience, and on the left side you have the bad conscience. And the good conscience tells you to do the mitzvah, go, and the bad conscience says, ah, what are you doing? Eh, nobody does it, you don't have to do it. That's the fight that we always have. Between the good and the bad. So it says, Vayitzer. God created Adam with two Yuds. Yitzer Tov and Yitzer Ra. But the rabbis ask, the letter Yud is a holy name, is a holy letter. I understand Yitzer Tov is created with the letter Yud. That's the good guy. That's the guy that gets us to do good, that gets us to go to Olam Abba. But the Yitzer Ara should be represented in the letter Yud. He's not Sha'amir Ushah. The Yitzhar is the Satan, the Malach Mavit. Why should he be represented in such a beautiful letter? I would give him the letter Z in the English alphabet. Give him the worst letter, give him the X, give him the, the end of the alphabet. You're giving him the prestigious letter Yud? The Yitzhar, two Yud, Yitzhar Tov, Yitzhar Ra. Why? So I'm going to tell you a very important concept that's brought down in the Sfarim. It says in the Pasuk that we say in the Kiryat Shema every day, a few times a day. You have to love God and serve Him with all your heart. How do you say heart in Hebrew? Lib. Lib is a heart. With all your heart. So if I was writing the Pasuk, I would have said, You have to love God. With all your heart. But it says, Lebabecha. The Babicha means with all your hearts. How many hearts do you have? You only have one heart. Why would the Pasuk write it in plural? So the Gemara says, Ah, Bechol Le Babicha means with both parts of the heart. You have to love God and serve Him with the good inclination, and you have to serve God with the bad inclination. With the Yetzirah. Oh, this Gemara is very, very complicated. I know how to serve God with a good inclination. And make a beracha before I drink. If I have an urge to do something uh, bad, uh, control yourself. Uh, good. To study uh, Torah, uh, to give tzedakah. I know how to serve God with a good inclination. How in the world am I supposed to love God with a bad inclination? What, to do sins? I can't, 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 that's not serving God. What does God want from me? I want you to love me, not only with a good conscience. But with the answer, I also want you to love me. So I, I, how should I love you? You want me to get angry? Is that because the answer wants me to get angry? Should I get angry? No, you can't get angry. It's a sin. But you told me that I should serve you with the answer. Ah. <laughs> so I was a catch twenty-two. Oh, so this is the big hadush of the of the afternoon. There was one rabbi, the Belzer rabbi. It was a big rabbi. One morning, he was in his house, or his apartment, wherever it is. 
and he heard noise outside. Early in the morning, it was still dark outside. Maybe 3.30 in the morning. And he sees one of the, uh, the workers that's working on the street. Maybe it was a garbage collector or whatever it may be. And he's up 3.30 in the morning and he's uh, doing his job. So the rabbi said to himself, I have a much more important job than this garbage collector. If he can get up at 3.30 in the morning to go collect rubbish, I shouldn't be able to get up at 3.30 in the morning to serve God. Which means he learned from the people that if they are so diligent and they are so zealous in their shtuyot, in their foolishness, or even if it's not so much so foolishness, if he's making a living and he can get up so early, so I'm making a living for eternity. Whose living is more important? The Olam Abba is more important. If he's willing to live in this world, to wake up so early to exist, I shouldn't wake up early in order to exist in the next world? So the tzaddikim are always learning from the adversaries. They're always learning from the way other people serve whatever they serve. So they take from them and they use it to serve God. You understand? I'll give you, I'll give you an example. There was one time, one of the, the, the boys in the shul, he said that he didn't sit in the sukkah, one of the nights of Sukkot, because it was too cold for him. Sometimes Sukkot, it gets cold. He sat in the house. It wasn't raining or anything like that. It was just a little cold. A jacket would have been sufficient. But he was uh, very finicky, uh, like spoiled a little. But it's too cold, I- I'm going to go in the house. So I told him, shame on you. You ladies won't appreciate it, but there's a sport, you probably never even heard of it, they call it football. Football, they play it in the, in the winter, they have a ball, and they throw it, and they tackle each other, it's a, it's a game, it's not important. And one of the teams is the Green Bay Packers. Green Bay is in Wisconsin. In Green Bay they have an outdoor stadium. Now in the winter in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it's 20 degrees Below zero. It's freezing. It's an ice box. It's freezing cold. And sometimes they show the games in Green Bay that they play. Either on a Sunday afternoon or a Monday night. And you see the smoke of the, of the freezing cold just coming off the field. The vapor just coming off the field. You look at it. Even though you're watching it in your house, you get cold just looking at it. You see how cold it is over there. And then they show you the fans. 70,000 people are not watching it in the living room with, with, with the, heated, the heater on 72 degrees. They're at the game itself and they're watching the game and they sit for two hours minimum cheering on the, the team. And then they show the, the, some of the crazy fans. One guy doesn't have a shirt on and he has on his body green, go Green Bay, go Packers. And I said this, Rasha, to serve Shtuyot, to serve nothing, to serve, a, and if the Green Bay Packers wins, what does this guy gain? He gets nothing, he gets a cold, he gets sick, he gets pneumonia. What, what does he gain if the Packers, he gets nothing. Vicky, they give him money, they don't get any money. He, he's just going, on the contrary, he has to pay money. He has to go into the stadium and pay money for a seat, in order to put himself under such conditions, to watch what? To watch something that doesn't mean anything, not doesn't mean anything the next day. It doesn't mean anything as they're doing it. It doesn't mean anything. The he who cares who wins the game. It doesn't mean anything. I said, and for this shtuyot, this guy's willing to sacrifice. And we can't go sit in the sukkah. Where God says, I'm going to pay you to sit in the sukkah. What am I going to pay you? I'm going to pay you eternity. I'm going to pay you olam abba. Because it's not exactly the perfect degree. So therefore, Stenish, you can't sit in the sukkah. You have to learn from the Yetzir Hara how to serve God. Look at the Yetzir Hara, the way the people worship the Yetzir Hara, what they do for their Averot. How they'll go to the end of the world in order to fulfill a lust. People will travel on a plane for 10 hours to go to a certain exclusive place just to have the Yetzir Hara. And a person cannot go to uh, uh, 10 minutes to walk to the synagogue on Shabbat. 
Here a person will get on a plane, he'll go to uh, Midbar Sin, to Sin City, in order to make Averot. And over here, he's too lazy to go 10 minutes to serve God. You have to watch the way the people go after the Yetzirah. And from that you have to learn how to serve God. So the Yetzirah is very important. The Yetzirah is actually our teacher. That's why David Amalek writes in his Tehillim, Me'oyevai tehakemeni mitzvotecha. Me'oyevai, from my enemy, my enemy will teach me about your mitzvot. I wouldn't have said that. I would have said, I learned Torah from my rabbi. Nabi said, of course you learned. I don't have to tell you that. Of course you learned Torah from your rabbi. I'm telling you better, Hadush. You learn Torah from your enemies. Watch the way your enemies serve the Yetzirah. Look at the way they go after their passion. Look at the way they go after their desire. Look at the way they do sins with a gusto. Look at the way they do sins with a, a, such a, a, an excitement. Good. Now you take that and you just apply it to the mitzvot. You can learn from them. You know why? My mitzvot lasts le'olam. The Green Bay Packer game is temporary. It lasts only for a few moments. But this, my mitzvot, it's something that is eternal. And therefore, it's good. You need a teacher to teach you how to do things the right way. But sometimes you have to learn from the enemy. I'll tell you even better. What does it mean to learn from the Yitzhak There's so much you can learn from the Yitzhak He has a lot to offer us. When we have a fight between the Yitzhak Tov and the Yitzhak who usually does more of the arguing? Most of the time, it's the Yetzirah that's trying to seduce us. And for some reason, the Yetzirah Tov is very quiet, usually. Once in a while, the Yetzirah Tov will throw in, ah, don't do it. But the Yetzirah says, ah, go, don't worry, just do it. But he's pushing you, and he's going, and he's trying to tell you many things. Where's the Yetzirah Tov in all this? How come he doesn't fight back? It's like you have a debate. You have people debating. One guy is giving all the reasons, the other guy is just sitting and keep quiet. Open your mouth! How come it's not a fair battle? Why is Yetzirah always doing the talking and the Yetzirah Tov usually is quiet? And shall I tell you why? <laughs> when you go to the market, not to the supermarket, to like a, a flea market, where people are selling all their uh, stuff. So there's one seller, he's screaming, come here, we have good stuff, look at this over here, look at this item over there, this, this is good, this, uh, feel it, and there's that. And the guy next to him, he's selling similar stuff, he doesn't open his mouth. <coughs> What's the difference between them? The guy that has to scream and yell, he knows his stuff is junk. He knows it's inferior, so he has to make a lot of noise in order to, to sell it. Because he has to compensate by screaming and yelling, because he knows the stuff he has is junk, so the screaming compensates. The guy who has the real goods... He says, I'm going to say nothing. The customer is going to come. One second he'll see it. He's going to know. And if he doesn't know, good. somebody else will know. There's a, for good stuff, there's always a customer. But for junk, you have to make noise. So the Yetzirah, he's selling us junk. He's selling us Gehinnam. So he has to make Gehinnam look good. So he's telling us this claim and that claim. You know what? The Yetzirah Tov doesn't talk so much when we are... Because the Yetzirah Tov is selling us Gan Eden. It sells itself. Oh, I have to say anything. Is it? He's screaming and yelling. From the fact that he's screaming so much, the Yetzirah, that should be the biggest proof that he's wrong. You can learn from the Yetzirah. You know how you... I learned from my enemy. The fact that he's so seduced, seductive. The fact that he's so uh, 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 vociferous, he's so uh, 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 argumentative, he's so uh, 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 cunning in all his claims. I say, you know what? He must be the liar over here. Why is he talking so much? That's what it means. Use the Yetzirah to serve God. From the fact that you see the Yetzirah tries to push us in so many ways, must be he's selling us fake goods. And from the Yetzirah talk that's keeping quiet, must be as the Emet. But I'll tell you deeper how you learn from the Yetzirah. If 
if you look at our generation compared <coughs> to the previous generations, I think it's clear that there is definitely more uh, pleasures, more ability to sin, more accessibility to sin, more opportunities to sin in this generation than the previous generations. I think nobody will argue on that. Uh, I'm sure there was addiction 50 years ago, but not the addiction that we have to the extent that we have it today. And I'm sure there was always different types of uh, pleasures that were available, but again, not in the way that we have it in our generation. With the technology and all the advancements, now with all this promotion of the Yetzir Hara, I ask you, has life become better? In our generation, in America, which is the richest of all the countries, what do I mean rich? Today, even a person that's a middle income person, made more money, or makes more money than a rich person of 50 or 100 years ago. Today there's great affluence, and everybody's running after the pleasures of this world. The, uh, uh, the pleasures, the... The hana'ot, the desires, the lusts. So can you answer me a question? Why is there more depression in this generation than in any other generation? Why is there more suicide in this generation than any other generation? You know what that proves to me? That the Yetzir Hara, it doesn't work. That lifestyle does not bring to bliss. That lifestyle does not bring to happiness. With all his seductions and all his tricks and all his uh, uh, giving to us all these things, what did it bring? The world has more crime today than it ever had. There's more jails than there ever was. But there's more sicknesses than there ever was. So, what, what, what are we doing then? So therefore, you say to yourself, the Yetzirara, from looking at the product of such a lifestyle, I learn from the Yetzirara, not at what he's doing, what is the result? The biggest Yetzirara is found in the, in the entertainment industry. By movie stars and all these uh, people. You won't find a more miserable bunch of people than these movie stars. <coughs> if you start to look at their lives, you wouldn't wish the way they live with all the troubles that Saron, this one's married four times, and this one has a, a, a kid that's an, an addict, and this one also tried to commit suicide, and this one committed a crime. And, and you say, what are you talking about? With all the money, and with all the... Uh, and look at that. Nobody would envy such a lifestyle if you see the way they live. I have no doubt, if you go to B'nai Berak, or you don't have to go so far, and look at a Tamil Hakan that studies Torah, the religious people that are following religion the right way, you'll see a different lifestyle. The Torah brings a person satisfaction. The Torah brings a person Minuhat nefesh which is peace of mind. You all know it. For no other reason, you benefit from coming to the class, even if you don't understand every single detail of the Shi'ud. But for some reason you feel a, a tranquility. There's a tranquility in Torah. A tranquility that you cannot get from a Blackberry. You cannot get from a computer. On the contrary, that's pressure. That's a pressure. Every time the phone rings, it's a pressure. You come to Torah, it's almost you unplug yourself from the world. And you enter a higher level world. The world of soul, the world of spirit. That's why we call a yeshiva a yeshiva. Yeshiva. Why? So one rabbi said... Not because you sit. Yeshiva. And let's say I want to stand. I can, I can stand also if I want. As a matter of fact, in the olden days, there were no chairs in the yeshiva. In the olden days, you had to learn standing up. 
a thousand, uh, two thousand years ago. You had to learn standing up because kavod of the Torah. You're learning Torah now. You're going to sit. However, when the rabbis saw that the people are too weak, they can't stand for ten hours a day, so they decided to make a rule: you could sit. But even when they were standing, they called it a yeshiva. They didn't call it an amida when they were standing. It was called yeshiva. Why? Because Tavira Melech says in Tehillim, Torah Adonai Temima Meshivat Nafesh. The Torah of God is perfect. Meshivat Nafesh. It settles the soul. It brings a peace. The Torah is therapeutic. So yeshiva is Melashon Yeshuva Da'at. It brings a person serenity. It brings a person a tranquility of mind. And therefore, <laughs> go look. Look at what the Yetzirah's lifestyle offers. And look what the result of the lifestyle is. Those that go after their pleasures, either they end up in a, a drug uh, rehab, or they end up Hazrat Shalom uh, hurting themselves, or they end up in a prison somewhere. Where does the Yetzirah's life, where does it bring them? Or they drink themselves until they're sick. Where does all these pleasures get them to at the end of the day? It only brings them to a destruction. From the Yetzirah, I learned how true my side is. This is what it means, serve God with the Yetzirah. Learn from Him, and then you can... The biggest proof that the Yetzirah Tov is right is from the Yetzirah. Just study Him good, and then you'll know that how right you are. Study the enemy. And then you'll know exactly a strategy how to serve God. Oh. If this is true, we can explain many Pesukim now. They say, when Yaakov Abinu, before he went to, before he went to Laban's house, because he had to run away because Esav wanted to kill him. So he was running away. He was going to go to Laban's house. And he ended up working there for 22 years. He worked there for a long time. He married his daughters. You know the whole story. So before he left, he made a deal with God. He said, God, if you send me and you bring me back in peace, and I return in peace, call Asher to tell me whatever you give me, I'm going to give you 10%. Simply it means whatever money I make, God, I'll give you charity. But on a deeper level, it's like this. Listen how beautiful. Yaakov Abinu knew, now he's going now to be with the Rishayim. He's going to spend now many years with Lavan. There's two options. Either Lavan is going to have an influence on him, or oh, he's going to have an influence on Laban. Now there's no chance that Laban's going to get influence. He's an Asha, he don't want to get religious, he don't want to know nothing. So the only other option is that Laban is going to influence Yaakov. Now how can Laban influence Yaakov? So the only way he can influence positively is Yaakov will look at Laban, how tricky he is, and how diligent he is in all his games, and all his uh, 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 chicanery, and all his yetzerara, and from that Yaakov Avinu will say, if he can serve his foolishness with such uh, alacrity and such diligence, I'm going to serve God the same way. And that's what he did. He says, Bechol Asher Tetenli, any position you put me in, Aser Aserenu, I'm going to serve you God with the two tens, the two yuds. Aser Aserenu, I'm going to serve you with the yetzerara tov, and the yetzerara. Aser Aserenu, when you created man, it says, Vayitzer. You created with two youths. Yes, Tov, yes, Tov, God. And uh, Yaakov Yenu says, I'm going to fulfill the purpose. I'm going to serve you not only with the Yetzir Tov, but when I go to Laban's house, I'm going to learn from him how religious I should be. Because he's the Yetzir Ara. He's my enemy. I'm going to learn from him. That's what he says. Aser, Aser, I'm going to use both youths. Oh. If this is what you understand, now you understand, the Pasuk says, that when he was by Laban's house, after whatever many years, he decided he has to leave. So he got up in the middle of the night, and he ran away. And then Laban chased him. And the Pasuk writes, Vayignov Yaakov etlev Laban harami. And Yaakov stole the heart of Laban, 
Al beli higidlo ki boreyachu. Because he didn't tell him he's running away. So it's like he tricked him. But the, the rash on this pasuk is, Vayignob Yaakov et lev Lavan arami. He stole the heart of Lavan, which means he took the heart of Lavan, Lavan's heart that was forbid. He took it for himself. He used the evilness of Lavan in order to serve God. He stole his heart. He saw Lavan gets up early in the morning and he's planning and he's plotting his next game and his next trick. He saw how much time Lavan wastes for all the frivolities of this world. How much he strategizes to fool somebody. When he paid Yaakov Abinu, he changed his salary a hundred times. I'll give you a hundred. Okay, give me a hundred. No, I didn't say a hundred, I said ninety. Oh, give me ninety. No, I didn't say ninety, I said eighty-three. Well, he kept on changing a hundred times. So Yaakov Abinu says, this guy is so loyal to his uh, a wise guy. I learned from how to serve God. That I should be just as loyal. He, he stole. It's a good stealing. He stole from Lavan to himself something good. And that's why when Lavan found out about this, he says, Why did you steal my God? Meaning you stole from me the way I serve my God. You stole it. He didn't steal the actual God. You stole my service for yourself. And not only that, the sons of Lavan, when they caught up with Yaakov, I mean the children of Lavan, Yaakov's brothers-in-law, what did they say? They said, from what belongs to our father, he got all this glory. The simple interpretation is they were saying, eh, all his money comes from my father. But the deep interpretation is, what's belonging to our father, meaning his way to serve the Yitzhara, all Yaakov's glory in being so religious, he learned it from Lavan, as the religion, Lavan's like the guy in Green Bay without a shirt on. And Yaakov's watching this guy with such, such misrutef, and such sacrifice for, for, for foolishness. That's my father's way. He took it and he used it for God. That's why it says also, ah, there's many did a short on this. You could learn from the Yitzhara. It says, when Yaakov went to get the blessings from his father, what did Rivka's mother do? She dressed Yaakov in the clothes of Isab. She put on the hairy clothes. So when he went to the father, he felt him, and he felt that he was hairy. He thought he was Isab. The Pasuk says, Vatikah Rivka, Rivka took, it bigdeh Isab bena gadola hamudot. She took the beautiful clothes of Isab, Vatalbesh et Yaakov. And she dressed Yaakov. The depth of the Pasuk is, she took the beautiful traits of Esav, or the clothes of Esav, meaning the way of Esav. Esav is the Yetzirara. Esav is the Satan. She took the good that you could learn, and she put it on Yaakov. She dressed him with Esav's way. That means you could learn from the Goyim. You could learn from the, from the, uh, the people that don't have Torah and Mitzvot. You could learn from the ways of the Yetzirara. Use that in order to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If this is true, now we understand also what we started with. Remember I told you Yaakov took the Yud? What is he taking the Yud for? His name should have been Akiv. Uh, he took the Yud of Esav. Because the Yud of Esav represents the Yetzirah. That's the Yud. Esav is the Yetzirah. Is... Yaakov says, hey, I need that for myself. Hey, what do you need the Yetzirah for? You're a religious guy. You don't need the Yetzirah. Hey, of course I need it. Give it to me. Because I'm going to convert from the Yetzirah and I'm going to make him good. Because I'm going to use him to serve God. That's the depth of what it means. He took the Yud of, of, of Esav and Asha. He took the, 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 the bed of Esav and he says, I'm going to use it in order to get closer to Hashem. Now if you understand this, I can tell you a, a big Hadush. Yaakov Avinu has two names. One is Yaakov. Very good. One is Yisrael. I knew you knew that, but this part you don't know. You don't know everything. Now, Yaakov and Yisrael. When did they make this name change? When did he go from Yaakov to Yisrael? Very good. When he was fighting with the angel. One night he went on a thing and he was alone and the angel came. The angel was the Satan, by the way. Satan himself. And Yaakov was so strong he was able to overpower the Satan. So, uh, Yaakov, the angel says, what's your name? My name is Yaakov. Not anymore. 
your name is now going to be Yisrael. What is the Yaakov Yisrael? Incidentally, his two names start with Yud. Yud, Yud. His initials. Yud, Yud. Which means he has the Yitzhak Tov, and he has the Yitzhak Tov as well. But that's a side point. The numerical value of Yaakov is 182. Take my word, I already did the math before I got here. 182. The numerical value of Yisrael is 541. Yisrael equals 541. Yaakov equals 182. Don't add them together. Watch. The difference between 541 and 182, the difference is 359. That's the difference between the two names. Guess what? The word Satan is 359. Which means, Yaakov Avinu, after he left Laban's house, and he learned how to use the Satan in order to serve God, because he learned from the enemies, he learned from the bad way, now he took the Satan, and he went from 182, add Satan, add 359 to 182, and you get 541 Yisrael. Now he became Yisrael, because now he took the Satan, the Yisrael, and he, he uses it to serve God. Add Satan to Yaakov, and you get Yisrael. At 182 and 359, that's why the angel said, you succeeded. You're unbelievable. You went to this guy's house, and instead of him influencing you to the bed, you became more religious from looking at him. You saw what a miserable life he had. You saw how, how, how sad he is, how unfulfilled he is. You saw how he's, he's so diligent in everything he's doing for shtuyot, for, for frivolity of life, from havel, havelin, aman, kohenet. And you use that, and you got better because of it. Wow, you unbelievable. You took the Satan and you, you converted him. <laughs> now your name is Yisrael. Yaakov plus Satan equals Yisrael. If this is true, what we're saying, we understand the depth of the following statement that Hakamim said. Hakamim says in Gemara, God says, I created the Torah. Barati, I'm sorry, I say again. Barati Yetzirara. I created the evil inclination. Barati lo Torah Tavlin. And I also created Torah, it's Tavlin. Tavlin literally means I created the antidote that breaks the Yetzirara. What breaks the Yetzirara? Torah. Study Torah and the Yetzirara breaks. But the word Tavlin. Really, in Hebrew, Tevalin is a spice. Now, if I was writing that Gemara, I would say, I created the Yetzirara, and I created Torah, it's poison. Because that's what Torah should be. Torah is a poison that kills, like you have poison that kills uh, 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 the, the, the animals, or kills the, the bugs. So the Yetzirara is a bug. So you say, I created Torah, it's poison. What do you mean, Torah is, it's spice? What does a spice do to a food? A spice, what it does to the food, it enhances it. It brings the flavor. It, the spice doesn't kill the food. The spice makes the food edible. Which is, without a spice, the food is no ta'am. The food is uh, unedible. It's uh, not that pleasurable. But you put a tivalina on it. Now you make from something that's bad, the spice brings out the good in the food. That's what God says. The purpose is not to destroy the evil inclination. You need him because he's a good role model. And therefore God says, Barati Yetzana, Barati Torah Tevalin. The Torah serves as a spice in order to bring out the good of the Yetzana. In order to use the Yetzana for the good purposes. There's no goal to destroy it. You have to develop it. Not develop it to use it. To use it against himself. You learn from the tricks of the enemy and you use those tricks against him. <laughs> That's the best way. That's why it says in the Mishnah Pilkeavot, Ezu Hagibor, who is the strong one? Hakovesh et Yisro. The one that conquers the Yitzhara. I wouldn't have written the Mishnah like that. See, everything, if, if, you're lucky I didn't write the Torah because I would have made all these mistakes. If it was up to me, every Pasuk would have been backwards. 
Ezra Gibor, who's the strong one? I would have written, Ahoreket Yisro. The guy that kills the Yisro. I wouldn't say he conquers it. Not conquer. I don't want to conquer the guy still alive. I would say, who's the strong guy? The one that demolishes his Yitzhara. But the girl, Torah says, no. That's not the goal to demolish it. It's to be Kovesh. Kovesh means, when I go to war, I take captives now. Now I conquered them. Now what do I do with the captives? They end up working for me now. They become my slaves. That's much better. If I kill them, they don't work for me. So instead, I conquer them, now they're my captives, now I convert them to work for me. That's the goal. Ezra Gibor HaKovesh at Yisrael. When you go out in the street, look at the Yitzhara. Look at what he offers. Look at the people that have been going after the Yitzhara and say, what life do they have? How unhappy are they? How miserable are they? How unsatisfied are they? Use the Yitzhara's Tactics to learn how false it is and the fact that he's always trying to seduce us. Must be he's trying to sell us a bill of goods. Must be he's selling us fake products. Learn from the Yitzhadaraz, from the people, the way they worship the stupidity with such uh, diligence and such uh, uh, kohot. <laughs> learn from them. If he has to wake up 3.30 in the morning, uh, uh, one guy was playing uh, uh, cards, uh, poker, whatever they're playing, the game, poker. You don't know who poker is. It's a game of cards. And they're playing till 3.30 in the morning. 3.30 in the morning, he comes home. If he can stay up till 3.30 in the morning, for what? For flipping uh, cards? For, 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 for a couple of uh, ent- entertainment? I could stay up till late at night and study Torah. You learn from them. And now we understand the depth of the Pasuk that I began with. The Pasuk says... Aser te aser. Simply it means give your ten percent. But there's a deeper meaning of this pasuk. The pasuk is saying the goal of life is not to give one ten. Aser te aser. You have to give God two tens. What's the two tens? The yud and the yud. The yetzer tov and the yetzer. It's not a monetary donation. It's not something that's in dollars only. The goal of life is aser te aser, to make sure that you have both the Yitzra Tov and Yitzra Ra confined. The Yitzra Tov, of course, is causing you to do good. And the Yitzra Ra reminds you how you're supposed to do good. And how good the good really is. There was one rabbi called the Admor of Rufshitz. He was a great uh, Hasid. He came along and said, those people that have Torah, hopefully the Torah gives them a satisfaction. So he said the following cute statement, and I quote it, and we'll conclude with this. He said, "Kasher enli ani rotze, az irse yeshli, memela yeyeli et asher ani rotze." What did he say? "Kasher enli masha ani rotze." When I don't have what I want. As in Tzir Mashiyeshti, then I have no choice to want what I have. He says, and then automatically I'll have what I want. <laughs> because now I want what I have, so therefore I'll have what I want. So therefore, but that only Torah gives a person that, 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 that ability. Those other people that are chasing themselves and they want more and they want more. Without Torah, it's endless. More things and more stuff. And it's all temporary. And it doesn't give them some ha- Where do they end up? In the rabbi's office for advice. Help me. Right? Help me. What are you coming to me for? I don't have as much money as you have, but we, you have uh, peace. You have Torah. I need something else in life. And I've said this a hundred times over. So I learned when, after I finish a meeting with us, you know what? Yesterday you told me a good lesson. You told me a good lesson today. You know what? I'm going to be much more diligent in Torah. I'm going to pray Amidah B'Kabana because I see without it, look what, look what you're offering them. You're killing the people. That's aser te'aser. That's the depth of ma'aser. Not to give only money to the tzedakot. Aser te'aser. Use the yetzera tov and the yetzera ra in order to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What a musar before the month of Elul. This is exactly going into the month of Elul now. These ideas that we have to start being mehazek ourselves. We have to start thinking now towards the day of judgment. We had a rough year this year. 
in the community, we had a rough year, and Am Yisrael, all that was decided on uh, Rosh Hashanah last year. Now the court, they're moving the chairs already in the courtroom in the Shamayim, they're setting up the, the seats in the, in the bed deep. So now, Shem Bashamayim, Mechin Kis'o, in the Shamayim they're already preparing the chairs. But what? We have a chance to set us up up for 30 days, we have a good uh, chance to appeal, to make a proper uh, 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 presentation to the court, but we cannot just show into the court, Erev Rosh Hashanah, okay, we're here, and we eat a couple of uh, lubia, and then we think we're going to have a good judgment. It doesn't work that way. We have to uh, prepare spiritually. And the way we prepare spiritually is, again, this concept of the Yetzirah talk, to take the youth from Isav. And guess what? We took the youth, we took Elul back. Yaakov took the youth, he took the Yetzirah back. We're going to take it for us. And then, Be'azot Hashem, and Yahweh Navi will come, and he'll take the Vav. And then Esav will become Ash. And then Bezad Hashem, Ba'alum Moshi'im Ba'al Siyon, Nishpot et Har Esav, Ayetal Adonai Menucha, Ba'yad Omai De Melech Al Kol Haris, Ba'yom Ha'u Yad Omai Echad Ushmo Echad. Ladies, just before we go, I was asked to announce something very important that is very dear to my heart. That is the Sephardic Women's Charity Club. Even though I'm not a woman, and even though I w- I'm not uh, privy to have a pouch, but... For all the women that are joining this group already, they took a pouch, which we're giving them out for free, and they put charity in it from time to time, every day a dollar, two dollars, whatever extra money they have. At the end of the month, we collect the pouches. Maybe we have three, four hundred, five hundred members of the group already that are all doing this. And guess what? Just this month, we gave out five thousand dollars to charity to schools in our community. Not outside all community schools that need the money in order to pay teachers, in order to uh, pay for equipment for the school. All our schools are in trouble, as we know. We've given out so much money over the past uh, two years or year and a half, maybe over sixty, seventy thousand dollars from what? From dollars, from a dollar, from uh, squirreling away a dollar a day in a pouch. And Baruch Hashem, I can, I can show you the, the thank yous that we've been getting from the community institutions. I once went to one of the rabbis in the community and said, I have a check from the Sephardic Women's Charity Club. He didn't know what it was. He said, okay, woman giving charity. I thank you very much, Rabbi Eli. And then he's talking to me about something else. Now, as he's talking to me, he thinks it's a $25 check in there. So as he's talking to me, he's playing with the check. He opens it up. He sees the check is $3,000. He says, oh, what's this club here? What is this? Uh, now you want to know what the club is. <laughs> Before you took it, you thought it was 26 bucks. Now already you saw the number. And this is the power. There's power in numbers. There's strength in numbers. And therefore, everybody should sign up, take a pouch, and Bezat Hashem will be able to continue to dispense the tzedakah on your behalf. Ladies,